if I'm using the analogy of software, if I change the operating system, all the apps that doubt yourself, they don't run on that operating system. My guest today is the world-renowned pianist, composer, author, and teacher, Kenny Warner. His landmark book, Effortless Mastery, has been revelatory for musicians around the world since it was published more than 25 years ago. He's just written a new book titled Becoming the Instrument, which guides us further along the path towards liberating the master musician within all of us. I consider Kenny's teachings to be some of the most important lessons any musician can ever learn. It comes down to nothing short of actually reprogramming some of the most ingrained beliefs and habits that are holding all of us back. I put links in the description to Kenny's books, which I highly recommend. Now, please enjoy this episode of the podcast with an American musical legend, Kenny Warner. more than using a fork. I normally uh, interview saxophone players. This is my first non-saxophone player interview, but I think you know, what you're teaching is really, really important for all musicians, no matter what instrument they play. I do teach all instruments just for that reason. Uh, for the same reason that you felt that about having a non-sax player on your, on your podcast. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, um, I read your first book effortless mastery like 20 years ago i don't even know when it came out 28 oh maybe almost 27 28 years ago now yeah so it wasn't moving on it wasn't all that new it was kind of new but you know um i read it back then it's new to everybody that hasn't read it well yeah well the thing is i just got a new copy because i don't know where my old copy went because it's 20 years ago, but I got a new copy and I read that again and it had, you know, it connected with me a lot more being older and more experienced. And, you know, so that's been, you know, I really enjoyed reading it again and I have it and I, this is the book for everyone watching. And if anybody plays music and they haven't already read this book, you got, this is on the list of must read books. And you can see in this book, I've got all sorts of highlighted spots um there's so many things in there and i'm actually planning on doing a video on my youtube channel just about this book wow have you read the second book well i'm in the middle of it i'm about halfway through the second book and that's i know we want to talk about the second book oh i don't know what we want to talk about you know i'm, I'm good for whatever but i just since you mentioned the book the second book is just 25 years later i mean i didn't release it until uh 21 or 22 but 25 years later, the subject that suggested its relationship to life had been totally manifested since I've been teaching courses at uh, with the Effortless Mastery Institute at Berkeley. I never taught courses before. I always went to a place for a couple of days. The concept raised everybody's hopes, but the neurological path that everybody was used to, you kind of get up and then, well, yeah, but this is really life. And then uh, Berkeley gave me the opportunity to do it in a, you know, over 15 weeks, you know, and then I had to come up with what do you do for 15 weeks? And the courses I do now, and I do them online for, because not everybody can go to Berkeley or come to Boston, uh, really help change the whole, you could say the polarity, or if the analogy was changing the apps, I actually think it's changing the operating system. So for example, if, you really, the book changes the polarity for a while, but no book can change you forever. The best it can do at the end is suggest the exercises that you will continue to do because to change your basic tendencies, and this is psychology, psychiatry, they know now it's, it's triggers and it's neurological pathways. And to change a trigger is not easy, but it is possible. You know, addiction is a very good example of that, you know with a daily dose of something that contradicts the natural flow, it feels like a natural flow of the addiction, a person can reprogram. So the book definitely changes 
your understanding. And then the courses are a chance to, if I'm using the analogy of software, if I change the operating system, all the apps that doubt yourself, they don't run on that operating system. So, you know, it's a good analogy. Mm -hmm. You could change some of the apps and, and it'll still work out. It can work out. It doesn't have to work out to the point of you're realized and go to India, but it can work out to the point that you're your own best friend. It can work out that when you're practicing or playing, you've been practicing embracing what you play instead of judging it. It can work out when you're practicing, you have enough self-support to not beat yourself up for not being able to learn something, to have patience. And then there is a sort of a Buddhist thing to it. I'm not a Buddhist, but detaching from the need to even learn something allows you to study it forever. Because why do you stop studying it? The ego says, man, I should have learned it by now. Or the ego says, you'll never learn this. You know? And, or, you know, and maybe it's going to happen tomorrow. Or maybe it's going to happen in another year. Some things develop over time. And they say in program, which is another great place I draw strength and, and, and wisdom, don't quit one day before the miracle happens. Well, that's perfect. So maybe the miracle of me being the person or the musician that I'm working on, may it, it probably won't happen in one day, but there'll be an advancement, an incremental advancement towards what? I have finally boiled it down to this, an incremental advancement towards feeling good. Now, it might feel good if I was a better musician. So if I'm making incremental deposits in my practicing of rhythm, harmony, or there I am rhythm, harmony, or melody, then I am progressively playing better, which is making me feel good. If it's in my life and I suddenly use this hand, no, they're both offline here. Oh, well, this is a, okay, anyway. <laughs> trying to make progress in my life, which is, again, I just want to feel good. And many people can, that sounds simple enough, but it's a very complicated time, probably always was, and feeling good can be a little tricky. Do you judge yourself? Do you make enough money? <clears throat> any other, let's say musicians. Do any other musicians realize that your music is worthy? And if not, are you unsatisfied? See, with Effortless Mastery, we don't deal with things we can't change. I don't know who's going to think my music is worthy. That's not up to me. But I can practice being more and more serene with who does and does not like my music. And in fact, being more and more serene about how I play, regardless of that is. And just one more thing, I'm sorry, Jay, you probably want to say hello and here I am going, but, but I teach a lot, so it just kind of comes out. The final thing is, if someone says, yeah, Kenny, I want to I want to be a wise Buddhist, you know, I mean, which is not, I don't think of it as Buddhism, I think of it as common sense. But no, you don't, you want to play better. Musicians will embrace philosophy, but then if they don't play good, they suddenly feel like assholes. And I say, it's not about how I, other people play. And, you know, you might say, I really learned to value what I do. And then you go out and there's a guy five or ten years younger than you, and he's playing his ass off on your instrument, and you're jealous. And you go, what an asshole. What a phony. I thought that I really bought into this altruistic philosophy and you do but any philosophy takes a daily if not daily regular incremental dose of a sampling that can change the polarity or whatever analogy you like so that that's the way you behave so supporting yourself jealousy is a big one you know it's people can't really control if they feel jealous and fear they can't really control. I just told you I had a, a kind of an emergency happen today uh, without going into it at all. My first reaction is fear. So the question is, am I chewing on how I change the situation, which makes me more fearful? But it's a bunch of stuff I can't control. All I can do is the next thing. And you actually determined what that is because when this thing happened, I forgot that I had an appointment with you at 10. So now I'm doing this. And at about 12, I'm going to go back to that thing. And I'm going to meet everything with compassion. 
I want to, I really buy for that one, the Dalai Lama's thing. It seems like the predominant thing in his brand of Buddhism is having compassion for the other, well, for everything, you know, for an ant. I tell you, I can't really get there. You know, like a, a, a spider, I'm probably going to step on it. A rat, I'm definitely, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to call somebody, but I am not going to honor that rat. But it's, reasonable, it's within reach for me to honor everybody I come in contact with. That's within reach. It's taken decades. So you program yourself not to control the world because that's what causes all the fear and anxiety. You program yourself to try to get closer and closer to a truth that makes you feel better and also treats the world better. And I found out that those two things are the same thing. You're not either selfish or you're Mother Teresa. I found out, and paths were suggested to me by various teachers, that the best way to feel good is to unburden myself of the suspicions, doubts, self-doubt, self-criticism. That's why I'm very active with schools, because most schools major in self-criticism. So, okay, I'm going to stop. No, I mean, this is why I want you here. I just want to hear you talk about all these things, but I know you could probably go on for for forever. So maybe I'll just try to direct yes, you in, in different out. directions. Bring because I know a lot of people watching, they might not have read the books. And but I know they're all dealing with all these things. And so I think one of the most important messages in Effortless Mastery is that, you know, recognizing, you know, that you have to be kind to yourself, that you have to have compassion for yourself. As as a musician, you have to stop beating yourself up. The only way to feel good as you say, you know, you have to start with accepting yourself. So maybe if you could kind of talk about that for everyone that's not really familiar. Great. Thank you. Because there's a schism between things that many people have said now and, and people acknowledge and being able to do it. Let's say philosophy. <clears throat> I always go left to right because I'm a lefty, but this is my right hand. Now. Philosophy, what you believe is over here. Hello. Right. But what you're able to do is all the way over here. And then the image, there's like a moat between what you believe and what you're actually able to implement, right? I think everybody can relate to that. I can give a few musical examples, uh, you know, phrases that roll off the tongue and are commonly said now, but no more people could do it than they were ever. Like, let's say, I'm sure you've heard, yeah, you got to love your mistakes. <laughs> That's popular now, you know? And it's the truth. You know, well, you don't have to. That wouldn't be the truth. But love of your mistakes is available with the right frame of mind. That is true. So then you play and you make even a few mistakes. And now you feel like an imposter. You told people to love their mistakes, but you didn't love yours. So that's just one example of how times we have a setup, this is what I believe in. And that's very important because another thing I've been saying lately, Jay, well, it's all there for years, but because I'm teaching courses, it gets sharper and sharper. Truthfully, I'm ready to break out of the music conservatory model and offer this to everybody because the next book, let me drop my hand for a second, Becoming the Instrument, but then it says, Lessons in Self-Mastery from Music to Life. That's the name of that book. I did not make that claim in the first book. I was just trying to help musicians get out of their own way. It seemed to me a niche of mine, and I don't like niche. It seemed to me, a, if you're older, it was a niche. <laughs> it seemed to be a niche of mine to see where musicians were judging themselves. And what was so interesting is that right there, their playing fell down. I don't know what kind of music you play, but if you're a groove player... If you are neurologically a groove player, in other words, you breathe, you use a fork, you groove. But there's a lot of people that are in a, a category. They can groove. They have grooved. Sometimes they've grooved really hard, and sometimes they fall down and groove less, right? This has not been neurologically absorbed yet. The next book is much more about neurology from a layperson's standpoint, but neurology nonetheless, right? So... If you're in that category that I really groove when I, 
I don't really groove when I, if I put my hands on a piano, they're going to groove. I'm not even grooving. But if I'm in the category of most people, I really groove when I relax. I really groove if I got enough sleep. Actually, I really groove if I didn't sleep at all. I really groove if I don't have a cold. You know what I mean? Whatever. In other words, your groove has not been, do you have any trouble using a fork when you're tired? No. Have you had trouble if you didn't get sleep? You can still use, we can make jokes about it. I hit my ear or whatever, but, and people do. That's fine. I love jokes. But in reality, I mean, just for the lesson. No, you don't. Uh, it, the closer grooving and playing is, it's never going to be to using a fork. I have to say for me, it is damn close. If I put my hands on a piano, they play incredibly. Now that may sound weird. But they play incredibly on two levels. One, because I am not trying to support myself when I play. Playing the piano triggers the highest feelings of self-esteem. And not because I play good, it's because of all this programming and the gift of teaching it, right? So one reason is I do. If I go, you know... definition of that is it's neurologically completely programmed walking if you're blessed to not have any uh walking issues you know normal walking is neurologically blocked in you, you don't say okay left foot now all right right foot oh, no, don't no don't do another left foot you know or like i didn't walk very good today because you know what i mean you're always going to walk you could be hating yourself afraid out of your mind or it's sad enough to have lost the greatest person in your life, and you're still going to walk. That's what I call neurologically locked in. There are a few musicians on the earth, and we celebrate them, that play. And I show videos of those people. Perhaps if, if you get a really good response to this, because I, I do get tired of doing it for what ends up being 12 people, because I want to help more people. <laughs> You'll be more than 12 people to watch. A few thousand people are seeing this and they're motivated. And we get together again and watch videos of people who do what we're talking about now. Mm. And you'll see it differently. Wow, they're not doing it. Their body is doing it. Yeah. The psychological element is, can you stop judging yourself long enough to let the body improve its performance in rhythm, harmony, or melody? That's all it's about. Everything else is romance and illusion. Even the meaning of music is very subjective. Maybe it means nothing. Maybe it, it does a burp mean anything? Does a fart mean anything? It, we can attach meaning to it. We've attached a meaning to music, but in order to even go to that runway, you have to be able to play it. So some people never even get to, to, to how they feel about their music, and they conflate that with the fact that they still haven't mastered even the fundamentals that will allow them to play. So they think they're not worthy. They think they're not deep. They think that Miles Davis was born to do this and not them. They don't know. If you haven't codified, completely digested the neurological action of rhythm, harmony, and melody, then unless you play free, and then it's all psychological. When people play free, it's quite amusing because they're often not free. They actually try to play free music correctly. That's like such a folly. I think the only benefit of free music, and I can't really think of much other benefit these days on a practical level, it was a movement at one time and it did make a statement. But today, if there's one undeniable benefit, it's therapeutic. The only way I can experience freedom or accepting myself, I don't have enough training to experience freedom and accept myself in B flat. I don't have enough training 
or freedom to accept myself in four, four time or in four and eight bar phrases. So the problem is it's more important to accept yourself and experience freedom. Well, free music makes you free of any of the requirements. You could just work on the self love. It's not like I had to make it to the top of the tune. And now I hate myself, which people do. That's how distorted it is. I don't have to make it anywhere. I just go. The second step of effortless mastery. I guess I could show my hands, but it's really not the point. The second step, first step of effortless mastery is going to what I call the space. And if you want, while we're together, we could do a brief example of that. But I'm in the space. I bring my hand over. I lift a finger. I dropped the finger, and at no time was I controlling the finger. The only thing I did is I lifted it because it created the desire to drop it. But I'm not involved. I, meaning the little I, the ego. It's the mechanics. If I lift a finger, it's probably going to want to drop on that note. And this neurology is far closer to the truth than all the romance about what this says about you and I, I'll never play or... God, I'm so afraid to play because music is so much better than me. There is. We need like five different sessions because you can spend at least the same amount of time on the spiritual malady, the same amount of time on the psychological malady, the, the same amount of time, which I'm alluding to now, removing the blocks from the physical reality. Because if you just train yourself physically, music is a lot easier than you think. But when you pile self-esteem on there and all that Trojan horse of egoistic fragility, it is nearly impossible. And those people I say, well, let's work on changing the operating system or the polarity or whatever you like and see if you, I, to me, a person that's been grappling about all their life, success is not how much better they play. Success is digging themselves while playing anything. Six, if they want to practice, and that's a big if, if practicing only exposes bad things to you, about you, see, practicing, you're approaching something you can't do. So if you're looking for that ego boost to convince yourself that you can do it, you're in an untenable situation. You could never practice. Because the point, at least my definition of practicing, if you just sit there and play, by my definition, if it's your definition, fine, you're practicing. For me, you're just warming up. Practicing for me is taking something I either can't do or I could do better and working on it very scientifically. That's the fourth step of the book, and which also says, you know, just physically, which is to say without ego, which completely clouds the whole issue. If I can't do it, I start breaking it down ways till I see, oh, I could do that much of it. Let me try that much. Let me move up and do this much of it. Uh, let me put it together. You know, it is very like sports training. The fourth step. I'm sure they go through some shit, but I never hear them talking about, you know, the emo they try to, they accept that the emotional issue is a non-issue. My body's not doing the right thing yet. Therefore, my body's not putting me in a position to be successful yet. You know? So all this stuff, um, if, if you don't support yourself, and I'm sure, I don't know how many people you got, but a lot of them are going to be going, wow, that's me. That's why the book has been very successful. It nails a very common human frailty, the narcissism. That's a word I only used in the last year or so. The sonic narcissism of needing to sound good. It would be okay if it made you sound good. But I always ask everybody in the first day of class, when you really need to sound good, how do you play? And it is a common answer. Almost the thing that I've ever seen that unites people more than anything else is really the ego. It's certainly not politics. <laughs> you know, I'll say it <clears throat> is stronger than what divides us. And I don't really see that at all. But there is one thing that we all respond. There's probably a few, but I'm being kind of cynical here. Ego. We all have the same urge, first of all, and I, to feel safe. And that leads to a lot of defensive actions, right? The urge to feel safe. So I have compassion for that. And I have to have compassion for myself. I've had many times in my life, I was trying to figure out how to get everybody to do what I want. 
because I won't feel safe unless I'm ensconced in this situation and I know nobody can do this and nobody, you know what I mean? It's very natural, but there's so much excessive narcissist, you know, the need to sound good. Well, it would be great if it worked, but when I need to sound good, I can't play. And almost everybody in the world has told me that. So it's pretty, it unites us. It's the same thing. Now, if I'm messing around and for any reason I'm with friends and I'm happy to see the friends, and I'm happy we're playing together, or in my mind, we're just fooling around. We're not at it. And this is why it gets right into the, the belly of the educational beast. You know, I'm not doing a recital. I'm not doing a jury. I'm not getting rated and I'm not receiving any critique slash criticism. I'm with friends who trust me and like me. And I like them. And the overall mindset is we're just messing around. Everybody says they play better under those circumstances. So the question becomes, now I rely for this on a loosely termed yoga, not physical yoga, the philosophy of, the, I, I've been asking Indian people, I say Hinduism, but I realize it's also a religion, so it might not be the right thing. Every religion, before it became a religion, there was a spiritual truth to it. And the religion that arose was the organization with the very well intention of spreading it, the truth. And then we know what happens to most institutions. And I could go off on another hour on that very easily. You know, but let's just stay with the spiritual heart of every religion, I believe, before it became a religion. I believe is identical. I mean, Buddhism is Christianity. Christianity is, you know, Jewish, uh, the, what's that thing they what they read? I can't even, you know, the spiritual, mystical, you know, Christian mysticism, uh, you know. And then Indian scriptural stuff, even though it's a religion, remained at least in words, very faithful to the original truth of the heart, right? So for these things I'm talking about now, I borrow from the study or whatever of that stuff. And why did I study anything Indian? I just wanted to feel good. I really don't assign any altruistic, you know, virtuous goal to know God. I know there are people that are born in this incarnation just to know God. And maybe I'm one of them, but I'm not in touch with that. It doesn't, I feel like an imposter. I just want to feel good, man. Is that too much to ask? It's not too much to ask, but there's a lot of tricks to it. And I take from any discipline and any teacher and any pathway, anything that I can carve together that becomes what I've just been calling lately, Long Island Jew Jewism. <laughs> what is it? Is it Buddhism? No. Is it Christianity? No. Is it Jewish? No. Is it Muslim? No. It's Long Island Jewism. Why? Because I'm a Jew from Long Island and I'm saying this. You know? So I just want to strip away all the romance because it doesn't help me. If I think you got to be spiritual, and this is what I learned from Indian philosophy. The problem is duality. If you have to be spiritual, then there's those times when you're not spiritual. The best thing is to cancel out spiritual or not spiritual, which makes you always spiritual, actually. You know, it's just like I want to play a solo, but I can't play a solo and judge it at the same time. It just can't happen. We don't have the CPU. You'd have to MIDI it, probably USB-C, not USB, to another computer, its sole purpose to analyze the stuff, but it doesn't get in the way of the other computer, which is only to play it. <laughs> you know? Mm. You can't do that, at least not yet. I just want to show this new book, Becoming the Instrument. So, you know, effortless mastery is, you know, this one is a lot about, you know, the headspace and getting, you know, past the ego. That's out of it. And Becoming the Instrument is more about the physical uh, implementation of that, I guess. And I was, you know, I was reading the part where you're, you're talking about Art Tatum recording with, with the headphones on. 
Maybe you That's can tell a story, about. and I was told it's true, but it doesn't really matter whether it's true or not because it really illustrates my point. Right, and your point, and then but then you said so you tried it out on on gigs and on recordings, and got re, you know results. Yeah, look, speak about hopefully for a moment. My challenge lately is to speak about something only for a moment, so I apologize. <laughs> Um, when you teach a lot, it's like the solos get longer. If you're on tour, the solos get longer and longer. <laughs> so that's what's been happening. Yeah. All right. Now, in the new book, I brought another example up. And this one is verifiable. It's in the movie, The King's Speech. Mm. Did you see that chapter yet? Yeah. Okay. In the King's Speech, it's about King George VI, who his brother abdicated, his father died, and he had a terrible stutter. He could not give a speech. He got stuck on like the second word. Now, because his brother's advocating because of the love of a American dev dev divorcee, he's going to have to be a king. Not only will he have to give a speech, he has to give a speech on the eve of World War II, as it's obvious that there's no other way to deal with Hitler except to declare war. This movie is fantastic. If people haven't seen it, it's yeah. one of my and because in the, it was dealt well with well by the actors and the director, but the story itself is amazing. When they say sometimes truth is, I won't say stranger, but definitely more amazing than than fiction. You couldn't make this one up. And there's one scene in there. He meets this unconventional speech therapy guy, who was recommended to him, and I think I'm kind of like that. Everything I've ever done to help people get what they want out of music and therefore beyond music. Um, I've come up with stuff myself and it just, I pulled it out of the air. I didn't really pull it. I found myself seeing it a second before I played it. That's jazz, by the way, you know? The greatest jazz players don't plan to play something and they don't anticipate it. They're actually almost in the moment. If they're not, nothing less than a, a phrase before the next place they're gonna go. And they don't really take note of that either. It's all neurologically locked in, but back to the story. So this guy, after he's seen the conventional guys, this guy starts talking to him about his past and, and the king who will be king, he's still a prince or whatever they were, you know, is appalled. How dare you ask me about my life? And, you know, he doesn't see the relationship yet, but so he's leaving. He doesn't like what this guy's doing. And, and the speech therapist, Godfrey Rush, he says, well, I can bet, prove to you right here and right now that you can read flawlessly without stuttering. And if I, I'll make you a bet, he said. And if I win, I get to ask you more questions. And Prince says, well, what if I win? He goes, you don't have to answer them. So the Prince says, well, that's, your wager usually involves money. You know, he's stuttering. Well, let's make it a bob, mate. A bob, I guess that's a shilling. Keep it sweet. You know, it's, it's such a great scene. One of the great, you can find just that scene on YouTube, you know, but, but the whole movie is one of the best ever made. And he won, a lot of people won Academy Awards, with, you know. All right, so what he does, he puts earphones on his head. This is what we were talking about about two days ago. So <laughs> puts earphones on his head. It's a recorder. You know, it's just a record player. This is like 1930 something. And then he's got this other thing called a silver tone. You cut a record and you plug in a mic and you speak into the mic. And, and Godfrey Rush says, this is, a, this is amazing. The latest thing from America. Back then, America was the father of all innovation for Europe, the most fascinating place. The silver tone, just out of America. So he puts music on, puts the headphones on, gives them the microphone with the other device. And again, first he gives them Shakespeare, to be or not to be. He said, here, try to read that. He goes, to be, or, you know, he stutters by the word that. And they go, see, can't read it. And he goes to pick up the, the shilling. And the therapist goes, uh, 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 I haven't finished yet. And he hands the book back to him. And then he tells him about the silver tone and the, going to put the head, puts the headphones on. It's a Mozart piece. I forget what it was. I In the book you said, book. Marriage of Figaro. Yes, yeah, so I had to look that up. Because all <laughs> I knew, was, I, I, I didn't even know who it was, but it was, Important if you're writing a book, it would be nice to say what the piece is. So, <laughs> yeah, he puts it on his headphones. He says, now read. And he says, you're playing music. And Godfrey Rush says, 
yeah, just read. But how will I hear what I'm saying? And Godfrey Rush says, well, certainly a prince's brain can concentrate on more things than once. And he goes, you're not very familiar with royalty, are you? <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. So then he starts speaking. We don't hear him. Then he turns the music up. It's so loud. He doesn't hear him. And after a while, he just pops him off. See? Totally bad. You know, blah, blah, blah. And he's angry now. And Godfrey Rush says, that was sublime. And then he says, I don't think this is for me, doctor. I'm sorry. And he's not a doctor. And he never said he was. I don't think this is for me. I'm sorry. You know. So he says, uh, well, okay. Do me a favor. Take this acetate. I believe that's what they were. But he says, take this recording as a... Uh, souvenir of our meeting so he does then the next scene he's with the king who speaks very out his father speaks very eloquently on the radio and then he pressures him to get it together and of course it was the pressure and abuse from his father and his nanny and all this that caused uh they had, he had to wear braces on his knees for like years because he was knock knee all this stuff caused a stutter at about five years old but he didn't understand any of that right so the king is trying to do his usual, come on, boy, get it out, get it out, you know? Like some, like the music teacher in that movie. Uh, Whiplash. Whiplash, right. Except that kid somehow comes through. That movie, for me, was very ill-informed. Okay. Anyway, so he can't do it. Now he's at home. He's got a towel on his head. And he's listening to music on a phonograph. And he goes, and he's smoking cigarettes. He died of cancer, you know? And he said, he just goes to the drawer and pulls out that record, right? And he puts it on. And he hears him say, you're playing music. And the, the exchange, you know, certainly a royal can, you know. And then he goes, to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it's nobler to, I don't remember the rest of it. And he's sitting there like, then his wife, the queen who became the queen mother, whose heart is breaking for him, you know, she comes in. And they've never heard him speak like that before. So it's even a better example of Art Tatum listening to the World Series and just playing. I did it many times, not necessarily the World Series. There's a record of mine called The Space. And I thought, which I finally, let me name a record of the truth of which I teach. It's not about music. The Space is the main, if you want, before we finish, I will sh give a brief explanation of the space and i will give yes. you an example of it but just before it right um so i finally made a record called space and you can check it out it's a really beautiful solo piano record and it's, occasionally it's technically uh pretty amazing but very relaxed i started i put on a talk on my headphones i'm in the studio and i just trust it when my hands play it and at first they played very little Next, you know, they made some moves harmonically. And then, but I wasn't listening to what my hands were playing. I was seeing them, but it was almost spatial. It wasn't sound. I was listening to this talk on something to do with feeling good, you know. And I think the first half hour, 35 minutes before I took the headphones off. And that is the first half hour or 35 minutes of the record, including some highly technical things which I never played better because even when I was rehearsing them, I was trying to play them better. Now I was just going to go for them. If they came out embarrassingly bad, I just wouldn't put it on the record. So it wasn't like the courage of uh, whoever, but it still takes courage to be in a studio and not try to sound good. So you still have to, you're still dealing with that. Even when you go into the studio, you still have to kind of trick yourself to no. Ego. No, I just wanted to experiment with the ultimate. I had mm. used the example of Art Tatum. For years now, before I wrote the book, I had used the example of the King's speech. And I said, let me actually do it. Mm. Oh, and I sit down and play. How do, so the question would be, how do you do it without headphones? I look at my hands and I don't even imagine I have the same feeling as if they were somebody else's. Then this is the full result of studying the steps of effortless mastery, of getting from a full philosophy, crossing the moat to implementation. You know what I'm saying? The yeah. distance between philosophy and what we were talking about before is some sort of practice. 
And I won't even tell you I practice it as diligently as having the gift of teaching it like I am right now, over and over again. And it was always me, but it actually became me much more when this became the dominant activity in most of my days. I just, I always was that way, but now if I start to play for you, I'm not conscious of doing it. I mean, I'm conscious that it's happening. And I never would move a finger a half step up or down to satisfy some pre uh, expectation, some expectation. As soon as that happens, I drop my hands. A practice that was initiated in the steps of effortless mastery in the first book. So if I'm playing with a band, then let's say we're playing, you know, are you a jazz player? Or? Yeah. Okay, so giant steps. <laughs> I study it until it would neurologically play itself. Now, what I'm saying is, if I did get caught up in trying to do something, and the rhythm section is still going, probably let's imagine boom, ging, boom, ging, right? I'm going. to do that because I never get in the way. You can study something so much that it becomes like the beginning of our session here. Neurologically locked in. It's not like I have to talk much. So in the studio, there's nothing to look at. I might bring a TV in if there's a game on and watch it with the sound off. I've done that. Gigs. Probably did it recordings. I don't remember. But if I have nothing to focus on, then I will watch my hands and be as non- interactive as if they were someone else's hands. If I was watching someone else play, I wouldn't feel the need or pressure to control those hands because they're not mine. That would be my understanding. You can, and because I can do this, I can say to you with certainty, it's not some philosophy that the person saying the philosophy can't even do it. It is possible to neurologically get to the point where you trust you're a sex player, I guess, yeah. right? Trust your fingers. For a sax player, it's the relationship between the armature and the fingers. If you blow harder, the keys feel a little more percussive. If you blow uh, half much, they collapse a little more. And your rhythm's not as good. Therefore, if I'm working with a saxophone player, we restore a full breath so that it allows the keys and this motion to be more rhythmic. Why is your breath diminishing anyway? That's psychology. The less you trust your playing, the shorter breath you'll take because you're hoping to cut your losses in case it's not good. <laughs> so we work with any instrument with the same premise, with cellists. I work with great cellists and they play good. You're not great until these hands move by themselves. That's the phenomenon. You're not great. You watch Train. Watch Wayne Shorter. Watch Sonny Rollins. It defines in a different way than it's ever been defined. Why it's always on that level. Because it's no longer dependent on them managing the music. All they have to do is start playing and all the formatic things, time, rhythm, changes, four-bar phrases. They were already there. Lester Young sat around in a hotel all day and just drank, from what I understand. Then he went to the gig. Luckily, the horn played itself. Mm. Charlie Parker. It's so interesting, Jay. Heroin. Heroin. So what was the fascination of heroin? <clears throat> fascination of heroin is it was a, what, a shortcut to enlightenment, physically. And what I mean by that is, when you took heroin, there was no part of your mind or body that could care. All you had to do is kind of stand there. And if you're a yogi, so they might say, wow, you're in perfect balance. You're in perfect balance because if you're not in perfect balance, you're going to fall down. So a lot of things happen instantly with heroin. Now, 
It's just like steroids. Not everybody took steroids hit like Barry Bonds or pitch like Roger Clemens, if you know baseball at all. But they all tried it because they saw how it worked for these other guys, right? Talent is a factor too, but Charlie Parker would be sitting there almost asleep, but with his eyes open. And his fingers were doing this, and the breaths were like... And that's all it was, because this was already programmed to play a very highly evolved technology. Rhythm, smart rhythm, which I call, you're playing rhythm on the changes. So I could do another hour with you just on that. First is rhythm. Or so for a cellist, that's for a saxophone. For a cellist, they may have never liberated the bow arm. And they may have never liberated the uh, neck hand. Because from day one, their first teacher was getting to focus on playing the right notes. Which means they were never able to focus on the neurology or ergonomics or neuro, I've been calling it, I'm welcome for a scientist to give me a shorter name, the neurophysiology of what it feels like to play a cello. And in order to experience that, this is where effortless mastery is truly maybe the most innovative thing out there, at least for a musician. You could also analogize it to your life, right? In order to find the optimum neuro neurophysiology of how to play your instrument, you have to completely sacrifice the need to play the right notes. Believe it or not, I'm leaving a rest for that. That is... That's heavy. That's yes. a heavy concept. Well, and it doesn't exist anywhere else. I don't care what uh, holistic retreat you go on for musicians. If they don't tell you to suspend the need to sound good, and you let's say it pop, let's talk about popular holisticism, right? Letting go. That sounds right, right? There was this movie, uh, Ice Palace or whatever it was called. You know, uh, Frozen. This mega hit. Let it go. It was a mega hit. It was a great song, but also the term. It's like Nike ruined this term for us. Just do it. Ruined it. Can we ever say just do it? You see that stupid hook mark and a sneaker. You know? Let it go. At least it was a song, you know? But let it go is probably the dominant spiritual aspiration of 21st century mankind. If I could just let go. Now, I can't let go if I can't let myself fail. If I throw myself into the water, for a while I might be underwater. But the only way to find it is to let it, I will raise to the surface. And I'll gain an experience that can't be gained any other way. You just, if you want to move your fingers on the saxophone, you'll never know what that really feels like unless you're at least temporarily or for a few minutes a day. That's the thing. It shouldn't intrude on what you think real life is. But can you leave five minutes a day to practice perfection? Perfection is the fingers move by themselves. The mind observes. Now, for that, I take all my information from ancient uh, spiritual Indian, you know, literature. You know, the mind is an observator. The witness is what they call it. So anyway, yeah, <clears throat> everless mastery. <clears throat> uses, and I think there are something suggested, I saw something that they showed at corporations, but like creatively wasting your time or something, you know, there are probably other things out there. I haven't seen anything from music that doesn't place the quality of the music at the top. And mm -hmm. that and that way you cannot find liberation. Absolutely. You have to be greater than music in a humble way. So that music, in order to learn to play it better, if you're going to worship it, you're always going to be inferior to it. And then that's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. The space is the place. There's one room with all your emotions and all your problems. And then there's a room next to it. And it's a space. It's the absence of all your problems and all your thoughts. There's a crowded room of thoughts. And then there's a space, room where there's no thoughts. Effortless mastery assumes you're lazy, unmotivated, you know, uncommitted, right? 
the exercise that I'm about to show you doesn't take any commitment. And if you do it just what it is, it doesn't take any spiritual yearnings, doesn't take any time. The space is also a space between the past and the future. Space is space between the in-breath and the out-breath. And so I could, there's a lot to talk about this. Space is what the Christians call the Holy Spirit, what uh, Indians call it, Shakti. It is transcendent above the seeming physical impediment, imp impediments of needing to succeed, needing to support yourself, needing to feed yourself, real stuff, and a bunch of superimposed stuff, needing people to like you, needing people to respect you, needing to play good. That's, that's, that's more shallow than needing to eat. I understand that one. It's still ego, but of course you need to eat. Needing to play good, if you really get into the weeds of that, why? It, maybe many people watching are not even musicians. Why does it matter if you play good or not? It's inescapable. It's only ego, right? So anyway, that's it on the space. How do you get there? Here is what I can now call step zero for the lazy. Actually, I started to do yoga videos, and I call it this. Um, so I got to see it again. Um, I could never do yoga because I couldn't even do 15 minutes of it because that's how uncommitted, unmotivated. And I can do a, an hour on what I grew up with that didn't even allow me to study, you know, ADHD, Tourette's, very bad Tourette's, but for anything, right? I have formed my exercises to honor either I'm lazy or I can't focus or I'm uncommitted or I'm unmotivated or I'm uninspired and I can still do my work. Right. So when I figured that out, I put it into my teachings. So this exercise I'm about to show you is for you read that for the lazy, uncommitted, unmotivated and uninspired. Yes. Now, business wise, that's a huge market. <laughs> it's everybody. <laughs> Compassion wise. It makes me feel so good if I can interrupt that for anybody with something that works. So here it is. Are you breathing? Mm, yes. Yes. I usually make a joke. See, how did I know that? Yeah. <laughs> um, let's say you're having bad thoughts or the general thoughts that you're not who you want to be, which most of us walk around with. Say, okay, I, I've been doing this thinking for a long time. Whenever I get on this track, it never ends well. I don't end up feeling better. I end up feeling worse, right? When I think about what should be happening instead of what is happening. Okay, I want to interrupt it. That's one of the big words of only the last year. You can't change when your ego is coloring your life to make you feel a little sad or a little anxious. But there's a great power in interrupting it. That's the new word, interrupt it. So, yeah, I'm feeling vaguely unsatisfied. I've been on this road. It only makes a dark day. It puts clouds in the sky even if the sun is shining, you know? Because of the virtual reality between my ears. That's another one of recent. Virtual reality is between your ears, right? All right, I need to interrupt it. I'm already breathing. Do I know? Do you know? Let me do it with you. Do you know vaguely where it is you're breathing? And you point to the part of your body where you can feel it breathing. Wow. In here well, somewhere. Well, this, yeah. The thing that breathes is somewhere up here. I'm not a doctor, <laughs> right? If you just yes. stop, oh, yeah, I can feel it. What's oh, happening right there? Now, for 20 seconds, don't even watch yourself breathe. You found where it breathes, like going to the basement and looking at the boiler. Now, there's nothing profound about it, and it's got to remain unprofound. So now you know where you're breathing. You're changing already, and I haven't even given you the thing. <laughs> now that you know where you're breathing, simply watch it breathe only for 20 seconds, Jay. Go. Maybe we'll stop watching here. Just watch where it's breathing. And stop. They didn't say, see how long you can do it. I didn't say the change. In fact, the next step in this absolutely innovative process 
you've done it. You interrupted what you thought real life was, and it wasn't very sad. It could even be interrupted if you're too excited. That's equally dangerous, right? Or disruptive. Whatever. Interrupted. You're watching something that never changes. It never stops breathing, luckily. Luckily, your breathing is not as fragile as your playing. You know, because some days you're not in the right place. You don't play good. I don't care if it's the worst day of your life, you're still breathing. So it's a good model, right? You just watch it breathe because it's going to do it whether you watch it or not. Next innovation, only for 20 seconds. Why? Because if I said five minutes, I couldn't do it myself. Because <laughs> I am, what did I say? Lazy, uncommitted, uninspired. Okay, anybody relate to that? Does that ring any bells? There's so many things I'd like to do, but I don't seem to do them. If I cut it down to 20 seconds, I can do it any moment. Next innovation. Don't expect your problem not to be there. Don't hope your problem's not there. You know, you interrupted. Give yourself permission to go back to your problem. Okay, I was worried that my life's not quite what it should be. I took a break. See, well, the original trick is this. If you're totally watching your breathing, you're not thinking. That's in that book. That's early. Right. And if you're sort of watching yourself breathing, then you sort of have some thoughts in the back. And any percentage. And even if you think, shit, this works, I'm not, I'm not thinking. You're no longer watching yourself breathe. Any thought, right? Now, to interrupt it, I find, well, now I can interrupt for longer times. This interruption. But anyway, when it's over, you say, okay, now I go back to my problems. I'm going to think about how I'm vaguely unsatisfied with what I've achieved as a musician. Let's keep the music. One of a few things might happen. You took this break and you go back to it and it seems to be so much less powerful than it was. This demonstration of an interruption of illusion, ego is illusion. The illusion is that you're not blessed. I mean, I don't know what you live in. Was it Paris or wherever? I live in the south of France. Yeah, you support yourself, you know, whatever. You might think you're not blessed because you played a bad solo. You know what I mean? The ego is the whole thing. So now you don't want the ego to trick you. The ego would say, no, wow, you did that little 20 seconds, man. Now you're better than that. You're not worried about your playing. And two minutes later, you are. So you keep it as nothing but an interruption. I want to go back to not being satisfied with my playing. Now you're not disappointed. You gave yourself permission to go back to it. But anytime, that's the final innovation of it. You have acknowledged by just taking this 20 seconds that what you thought reality was, was in fact virtual reality. You've superimposed disappointment onto what might be a very satisfying life or at least a life to be grateful for. I mean, you're not living in the Ukraine. No. You're not living in, I don't know how many countries that would be a nightmare. You're not a, a woman trying to have a baby in, I don't want to say any country, because I'm not sure which country is which. You're not being castrated as a woman. You're not, uh, well, you're not, didn't get born a slave. I'm very blessed. That that right. I'm, I'm sure of. Yes, and... Many people generally may kind of feel that way, but they don't have everything they want or a few things that they want. They feel kind of like they got ripped off. Yeah. yeah. So when that comes up. It does. Yeah. I'm going to interrupt it. I'm already breathing. Let me watch it. Nothing more than that. You're not getting ready to meditate, so don't close your eyes. It's not spiritual. Because this thing was breathing when you weren't watching it. It's the boiler. You think there's anything spiritual about going down and watching the boiler? It breathes. Watch it. That's the space. And then we learn to pick up our instrument from there. No expectations, no fear of the future, no regret of the past, no standards to have to match up to. Just the space. We take that to step one, which you've read in the book. Thank you so much for sharing all that with us. Thank you so much for the books that everyone should read. And I hope that you'll join us again to go into more of these things. Thank you, Jay.